Good morning or good afternoon, depending on which time zone that you're in. And welcome to the Connexus monthly webinar series. And today's webinar is on herding cats, issues with distributed retail network security. So just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we have the, um, this, re this webinar is being recorded. And the webinar presentation will be made available to all attendees after you complete a short six question survey. And the recording will be available on the Connexus website for about two weeks. And, but once the survey is completed, a link will be provided to the presentation handout. So today's presenters, my name is Cara Gunderson. I'm the point of sale manager with Sitco Petroleum Corporation. Also with us is Ann Zecca from Connexus. And Connexus is actually the, um, the organization that hosts all the monthly webinars. And then our speaker today is Hubert Williams, who's the Vice President of Technology and Development at Maverick. So I'm going to hand this over to Hubert. Thanks, Cara. And happy Thursday, everybody. So for this presentation, Herding Cats, uh, there are a few outcomes we'd like to achieve. I don't think I have control, Cara. Go ahead. There we go. Recognize that multiple store networks are more difficult to secure than single store networks and understand why that's the case. See how threat evolution has forced retailers to change how we secure our distributed retail networks. Also want to take a look at some of the tools that are available to you for defending your uh, for your company. And then kind of looking at the big picture of things, you know, what's the big picture strategy to prevent, detect, and limit the scope of threats? So the agenda, understand the distributed retail network security landscape. Look over the strategy. I want to do an overview of layered security as well, that strategy specifically. Again, some of the tools. And then talk a little bit about threat intelligence and what that means and what that means to you uh, having complicated and distributed retail networks. And then a few bits of common sense, just some stuff. You know, this is one kid's opinion, what I've learned over 20 years of doing this. Uh, things that seem to work. And then we'll have a Q&A after. But do not hesitate to ask questions along the way, too, if you have them. So single site security, the good life. Think about it if you're running a single site, your single site company, you know, your perimeter is your store, right? Endpoints are real easy. It's the store. Uh, data and assets are static on the network within your store, right? You're probably a level four for PCI DSS. So just, you know, hub up everything and go to town. And that's kind of what it looks like. Segments, who needs it, right? I mean, it's really, really simple. But now you get into our world with a distributed network. Much more difficult. You're probably a level one or two or even three merchant for PCI. And that compliance that leads to a lot of complications with compliance level, as you well know. And segments, not only do, does each store have its own segments, it's probably its own perimeter. So there's a lot of complication when it comes to how you're networking and how you're segmenting your company. And this is even more lovely. As we know, in the last few years, hackers have been developing POS-specific malware, black POS, one that comes to mind right away. So if you're running a major uh, POS system, there's a chance somebody out there is trying to develop malware specifically for your system. And then something that we should not underestimate, mobility, dynamic data and assets, IoT, that to me is one of the big risks in our future right now. And Gardner had an interesting note on that. 80% of IoT efforts 
will not be driven, nor will they be initiated by IT. And you know, one example uh, I'll I'll go ahead and give from our company because I think it, it it's it's a neat example is we have put solar panels on some of our stores, and they are IP enabled and they are IP supported, and I had no clue they were going in before they were going in. That's something we as IT leaders need to be very cognizant of, and we need to uh, talk to our business folks and get them in the habit of telling us when they're going to do something like this. Well, let's just face it, guys. We're herding cats. We've got stuff coming from everywhere, and it's going everywhere, and trying to get all that stuff contained is really our challenge today. As an example, this is just a little case study or a model of what a store might look like. Yours may look like this or it may not, but it gives you an idea of some of the sophistication inside the store and to the network. You see you have multiple segments in the store, probably one for IoT and third party. You have a remote segment in your corporate office, probably for support. You probably have a data segment or something, some segment that's separated from your enterprise that's allowing you to do business with or do, do data transfers and do business with your stores and keeping the rest of the enterprise out of scope for PCI. And now the IoT, needing direct access to the Internet, how much fun is that? Lots of complication, folks. Lots of it. Oh, yeah, and I did mention EMV and IP-enabled pumps. A brand new uh, entry point or vector for attacks for us. Now, some of those pumps out there are running Windows, folks, and they're running antivirus, Windows-based antivirus. They need to be patched. Uh, antivirus needs to be updated. Do you have a strategy for that? That's going to be important for you. Okay, so let's start with the basics here. Distributed retail network security strategy. Don't, don't have to get too fancy here. What are you really trying to do? Prevent it. None shall pass. That's what we've done traditional. That's the old traditional model. Don't let them in. Well, that's great, and you should certainly do everything you can to stop them from getting in. But let's face it, a determined effort or an inside job, someone might get in. So then you need to worry, am I, is my scope limited? That's where all the segmentation comes in, right? Never let one store talk to another. If you, if you have IP access, if you can ping one store from another store, you really will want to rethink that. Uh, you need to limit the scope wherever you can. If they get in, isolate them to a store or isolate them to one little spot. Limit your damages. And then, of course, detection is really a big deal. And we're going to spend some time on that later. Because if they do get in, you want to spot them quick, and then you want to kick them out. It's one thing to spot them, but you need to have the mechanism to react. And that's really important. So that's a real, for, for in my in one kid's opinion, again, that's the fundamental strategy we're trying to uh, we ought to be uh, using to protect our companies. So going a little bit deeper, let's talk about the layered security aspects, right? In order to properly do layered security, you really need to know your attack vectors. Be familiar with the network. We talked about it a moment ago. You have, obviously, the stores, and you have IoT out there and you've got mobile running around all over the place, and now you're going to have IP-enabled pumps, and you've just got a lot going on. You need to recognize all those things, not let the business go crazy, too, with, again, with the IoT stuff. Right? Then ensure you're up to date with your patching and virus, of course. Firewalls and IPS between all the network segments, that's a big deal because, you know, without naming names, but one of the more famous hacks that's happened recently it had it was really a between segment uh, attack where millions of credit cards were stolen. The malware that was used was using a relay on a different segment in order to get the information out. So you really want to make sure you have IPS uh, between those different segments. And then there's threat intelligence. 
Collect and interrogate the logs from systems. This is huge too. And I, I hope you leave this session understanding the importance of this. Because in, if you are a large company, and the more stories you have, the more important this is, you want some kind of SIEM, something that's collecting all these logs from all these disparate systems all over the place and applying rules to those to spot threats. Important, more importantly, when you find those threats, act on it. Too many times we, we have systems out there that will generate logs. We even collect them. We may even be looking at them. But are we acting, are we actually investigating all of those threats that hit or that, are, that, are, that we see in the logs? It's really easy to blow one off because it doesn't look to be something significant. Well, sophisticated attacks these days are taking not, they're, they're, they're using other tools to help out. Again, the malware may sit on one device and use another device as a vector to get the information out. So you really need to look at that. And so act. OK. And we've heard for many, many years that latest security is the holy grail. Reality check, uh, it's not. There, there's really nothing holy about it. It's a real commitment. It's a commitment in terms of dollars to get the, the systems to allow you to do it. It's an investment in labor in order to properly employ those systems and look at the outputs and act upon those outputs. There's a lot that goes into it. It's a worthy investment. Now take a quick look again at layered security and the inventory, sort of some of the stuff that goes into it. I like this quote from, uh, from Neil Seaman. Uh, there are two types of businesses, those who have been attacked and those who have yet to find out they've been attacked. Then that's a typo. Find out. I think actually that's a Freudian slip because if you don't find out, you probably are going to get a fine. And of course, the NSA has been saying this for quite a while, layered security, defense, defense in depth. We've all heard these terms, right? Well, it's wise. You should be doing it. So the big, but it's one thing to have layered security, but you need to apply it in a really intelligent way. And Lockheed Martin calls the, the scope of threats that you ought to be thinking through when you're looking at layered security as a cyber kill chain. So when you're thinking about your layers, you have to be, once again, cognizant of where your threat vectors are. And you need to layer accordingly, right? From perimeter to endpoint, where, where can those threats be? What are those vectors? And apply some type of defense on each step of the way, all the way through that kill chain. So the basics, external IPS. Next-gen firewalls, something we're going to talk about a little bit. Application firewalls, vulnerability scanning, penetration testing. That's the stuff you do when you have the stuff. You want to test your layered security with those tools. Then IPS, again, deploy IPS and IDS, web proxies, spam filters, sandbox and SADN. Uh, SAMnet techniques, wherever you can, wherever it makes sense. There we go. And then the obvious stuff, antivirus, personal firewalls, host-based IPS. So individual hosts, it's not just at the network segments or uh, on your layer two devices necessarily that you have the IPS can also be within the uh, systems themselves, obviously patching and software updates. And then, to me, this is huge, and I hope you walk away with this, use, use a, it's SIEM to develop threat intelligence. I think we'll pause for a second. Does anybody have any questions? And I would, and this is Cara, and I would say if there are a few questions, and if you have any, please use the question box, which is on the side panel of your computer. 
And uh, the first couple questions are, what if your stores are connected to each other, full mesh, but you're limiting traffic? OK, so they're, 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 full mesh is fine. It's a matter of literally, do you have layer three access from a back office PC in one store to another? If you're not allowing the routing between them, that's, that's really what you're trying to achieve. Having them on an MPLS network, for instance, in a mesh, that's fine. No, no issue there at all. You just don't want somebody with physical access to one store to be able to reach into another store. Okay. Next question is, what are the most common types of attack vectors in a C-store? Easily, social engineering. That, that is, that's not even close. It, social engineering, people going into a store with their nasty USBs, uh, USB sticks, or social engineering their way into getting someone at the store to do something, right? This isn't, we're, I'm not, we're not centering this specific uh, webinar around PCI and credit card necessarily, because there are all, there, you know, there's PII available at the stores too. You want to be able to guard. Those of you who sell gift cards, you'll know, you'll be familiar with this. Someone social engineering into the store to get a store clerk to activate gift cards, right? It, that is our vulnerable point out at the stores. The holy grail for the hacker is to get to our aggregation points. But uh, if they can get to a store, they can do pretty well too. Social engineering, malware delivered through email, though, those main attack vectors. For sure, and, and also monitoring as well. I'm sorry, Hubert, but do you see like tank monitoring and video surveillance, those entry points as well as potential vulnerabilities? If you're segmenting those into your third-party segments, right? Not not necessarily the tank, but the video, for instance. Mm -hmm. If that's in a non-payment card segment, that helps. Well, we, just depends. Are you keeping PII on that same segment, right? Yep. Um, from a payment card standpoint, you can protect yourself that way. Great. Next question is, can you describe sand net techniques? You know what? I, I can, but I would encourage you to go online because of limited time. And look, fundamentally what you're doing is setting up test environments to go after, uh, to go after vulnerabilities and test vulnerabilities. You don't want to do that necessarily in your production. Yeah, great. And then the last question is that you know there's there's a lot of um, acronyms, especially on the screen, and I believe you're going to be describing those next. And so um, so they're just asking what those particular things are. And like IoT would be the Internet of Things, and maybe yep, you could describe I, yeah. what that means as well. Yeah, Internet of Things. That's uh, that's you know what I I don't mind. And we will go into depth on in some of these, but. Right, IoT, Internet of Things. It's all those things out there that require Internet access to be fully functional or to be uh, supported. And they're not necessarily your normal computer stuff. It can be refrigeration units. Uh, they may have monitoring on them just to make sure they're operating properly. Ovens are a classic example anymore. You'll see in convenience stores, you'll have ovens that are IP enabled so that from uh, the host, or from, from the corporate office, you can see if they're on when they shouldn't be, if they are on when they should be, uh, are we cooking at the right temperatures, all kinds of metrics coming from those. Right down to door, door relays, how many times does a door open? Right? The, the Internet of Things is just taking off on us right now. We're we are predicting in our company, we're predicting a 100% increase in the number of IP-enabled devices will have in the store in the next five years, almost all of it related to IoT. Yep, and you just mentioned your solar pan panels earlier at your stores. Yes, that's right. We have yeah, solar panels are going in. Uh, again, with refrigeration monitoring and, and oven monitoring, that's something that we have going on right now as well. The doors, uh, that's real too. That's a real-world example. We're also looking at uh, electrical and environmental uh, information gathering. If you think about it, you're, you're kind of doing it today. You Most of you will have, if you don't have, uh, automatic tank gauges, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of an IoT, an early IoT device, really. So yeah, lots of that. Yeah, I think there's an article about a year ago about tank monitoring as well, that that was one of the more vulnerable points. 
but to your point, you know, make sure it's on your on your segmented portion of your network. Yeah, put it on the segmented portion, and when you have to cross talk segments, poke the smallest holes you can. Yeah. You know, that's really what you're you're again. If you were hurting cats here, you you just got to keep them as contained as you can. Don't let right. things run loose. Right. So that was all the questions we have for now. So if you want to continue, that'd be great. Thank you, Hubert. Will do. Let's roll to the next slide. So some tools and methods that might help you out here. Okay, we I, I spoke earlier about next generation firewalls. And this is a straight up wiki definition of it, and I'm not ashamed to say that because it's a good definition. Next generation firewalls, flat out, they are doing deep packet inspection and uh, looking to catch malware before it ever gets to your network. That is a beautiful thing. They also usually work with or have built within them an, an IPS, which is an intrusion protection system. Um, IPSs are great when you're being attacked from the outside. Those are the things that will alert you to that to what's going on there. And so what's the difference between a next generation firewall and the firewalls that are really common out there? Well, legacy firewalls focus on source destination reports. It's a permissions thing. Uh, Network X can go to network I over these ports, right? Nothing wrong with that. That's good security, but it's doing nothing for what's actually being transmitted across. To the point of this next uh, this next statement, legacy firewalls do not identify and stop malicious payloads. Payloads, they just don't do it. It's not what they're built to do. And the evasive nature of today's attacks, in my very, very strong opinion, require us to be much stronger on that perimeter piece. I mean, I would ask, I would ask each of you to ask this question: What kind of firewalls are you using? If you don't know, you know, you really need to take a look, and it may be worth the investment for you to look into next generation firewalls for your perimeters because they're very effective and let me show you why in a moment. Oh yeah, so we're gonna talk about IDS and IPS. So intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems. So the difference, intrusion detection systems sit off to the side of the network. So they'll they'll sit on a monitoring port and they will alert you when they see things happening that shouldn't happen. And that's all based on rule sets. And we'll talk about how they get their rule sets in a second. Intrusion prevention systems are also, they, all, they do IDES in a way, um, but they're able to actually block that malicious activity. And you, it, they have each have their place, and sometimes they work in concert. That depends on your network. If you have a, um, you want to put in an IDES maybe where you have a fairly open um, segment, like a third-party segment, and you just want to be warned when something looks weird so you can investigate it and not stop it because it could stop business. IPS, on the other hand, you put that where, hey, you know what you want coming in, and that's it. IDS, IPS work in conjunction with each other because IDS rule sets can often be looked or applied to IPS systems and uh, for just an added layer of security. So that is a complicated topic, but if you're not employing IDS or and or IPS, that's something you ought to be considering in a distributed retail network. Any questions on that one? Because that's a heck of a topic. Not so far. Cool. Well, certainly ask later. And then something hopefully you're all familiar with is file integrity monitoring. I didn't mention it earlier, but this is extremely important, especially for your critical servers and I would argue your points of sale and anything processing payment cards for sure. Because file integrity monitoring can 
will will look at based on a base based on a baseline a gold copy of your server or your software it will alert you to anything that changed on that so did some malware hijack one of your DLLs it will warn you of that it's ex I, in my opinion uh, excellent excellent software I put it we put it on every server we have regardless of where it's at because uh, I think it's just critical uh, and it's one of the best ways to to prevent known files from changing where antivirus will catch stuff that is external from your service that's not really supposed to be there oftentimes uh, file integrity monitoring will catch stuff that's supposed to be there but is the wrong thing if that makes any sense so if someone hijacks a DLL it's pretty good at spotting that it's a very good tool um, Hubert we do have a question that just came in is um the file integrity monitoring part of a next-gen firewall? No, entirely different. This is, this is on the server itself. This is something you will apply to servers. Generally speaking, here's how it lays out. You'll have a fi file integrity monitoring console. So you'll have a separate application on a separate server, virtual server somewhere. And it will deploy FIM software clients onto all of your servers where you're confident that server is golden. There's nothing wrong with that server. It's, it's in pristine condition. You usually apply this when you're building the server. Frankly, that's the best time. And then you do that. It will send those alerts over to your console uh, and you can act appropriately. But it's not for firewalls necessarily, or at least I've never heard of a firewall with uh, file integrity monitoring applied to it. Okay. We've had a couple more questions come in, too, regarding file integrity monitoring. If the file is encrypted, can FIM catch it? Yep. It's looking at the hash. Okay. Yeah. It can catch it. If it's an encrypted file, if it's an encrypted system file, it, it's using, it, it'll look at the hash to know if there's a change. And then how do you find which files to monitor? Hmm. Great question. There's a little bit of an art to it. And you probably want some consulting on it to make sure. But you're generally looking for the core OS and some core application files. You will also have areas, you may designate areas on that server that are that are not being monitored. So especially where you're going to have files dumped all the time, you have data transfers that are happening all the time, you're not worried about that. You're probably not going to have your FIM looking at those. It's really core operating system, core system, uh, core application directories, things like that. Uh, there's a learning that goes along with deploying it. But once it's in place, it's pretty pretty low maintenance. Just got to get through the the initial setup. Okay. Um, there was another question um, regarding the definition of finding uh, file file integrity monitoring. I'm not sure if that relates to you know um, what you had talked to earlier about you know doing some research on your own or um, so. He's saying yes, it does. Same question. Okay. Yeah. It does, yeah. There are there are several products out there. There are several really good products out there. I can tell you that for sure. And it just it depends on you. I mean, your environment one will be a better fit than another. Uh, they're out there. Just type in FIM file integrity monitoring, and they will pop up okay. on Google. Great. All right. I think we can move on. Thanks. And this is something else I did not mention earlier, but something for you to consider is data loss prevention software, so DLP. DLP is an interesting one, and, and a lot of good companies choose not to do it, and a lot of good companies choose to do it. What DLP, in my opinion, is really good at 
it helps stop the accidental loss of PII or payment card or some sensitive data, something with a signature, social security numbers, for instance. It's not good, in my opinion, of catching a concerted uh, effort, someone who would encrypt it, for instance. If I get a file that's encrypted, you know, file of social security numbers and it's encrypted, I'm, an in, I'm a guy on the inside and I want to push that out over email, well, it's probably not usually going to do a very good job of catching that. But people doing things on accident like sending credit card information from the stores to the loss prevention folks in your corporate office to investigate an issue, yeah, it'll catch that. It'll also catch, you know, let's say someone from HR plugs in a USB and takes a bunch of uh, customer or user files, excuse me, uh, employee files home with them on their USB. It'll catch that too. So it's a layer of protection that's really good for the accidental stuff, the inadvertent stuff, or the things done in ignorance, and might be good for you, just something to consider. Any questions on that one? Yes. If, if deep packet inspection is enabled, can't the DLP catch the social security numbers in your HR case? I su that's a really interesting question. I suppose it could if it were if it had a if it were lo if it had the signature loaded, it might be able to do that. Yeah. And then I the added the added to that question was for encrypted traffic. So so if a deep packet inspection is enabled, can't DLP snatch or catch the uh, social security numbers for encrypted traffic? DLP will not catch it on the encrypt. It would have to be prior to encryption. Okay. Thank you. Those are all the questions we had at this time. Okay. And, and DLP is improving all the time, by the way. They're getting better at capturing some of the sneaky stuff that's happening out there, like taking a social security number and putting wingdings in between the numbers, stuff like that. They're getting, they're getting better at that stuff every year. And then layered security. So here, here's something for you to consider. And I think it's really, really important. You have these huge systems out here, lots of them. Lots of them are able to generate syslogs. Lots of, lots just on their own. You know, your, your routers, for instance, uh, you know, you have Linux boxes out there, whatever. Uh, Windows boxes are able to you know, deliver the WMI logs. You, all this stuff, that's flying at you needs to be looked at. And more importantly, the stuff that you don't need to see needs to be cast away so you're only seeing the things that are important to you. And SIEMs, which is security uh, event in, or excuse me, security information and event management systems, that's what they do. Their their whole job is to be that collection point for disparate logs and disparate information coming from all over your world and bringing it in and making some kind of sense out of it so that a human can interrogate that and make some kind of a, a reasonable action or take some kind of reasonable action based on the information it's providing. So, and I think it's a real shame, and I've seen it too many times, where we put in some best, oftentimes really best-in-class systems, uh, you know, from firewalls to, 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 to routers, you know, switches, you name it. And they, we have the ability to collect all this stuff, and we're just not doing it in the way that a human can understand and take action on. So I, I, I just hope you walk away understanding that security information event management is a really cool thing. And by the way, you can outsource it. This this is something that is available. You can have your logs shipped to. There are companies out there. You can you can ship your logs to them. They understand retail rules, and you can help them, of course, develop specific rules of your own. And they will shoot back the stuff you need to see and act on. You can make lives easier, or you can do it yourself. Any questions on that? That's a big one. Yeah. At this time, there aren't any further questions. Thanks, Hubert. Okay. 
Now with SC, with SIEM, what are you trying to really accomplish? Threat intelligence. But you're not alone. It's not just the stuff you're bringing in. It's stuff from all over the world that helps develop threat intelligence that gives you actionable information to work on. I want to explain that a little bit. So that screen represents, that's a, that's a snapshot from a trust wave, SIEM by the way, but that screen sort of gives you the picture of an SIEM and all the stuff that's happening. Well, here's, here's what's going on. Lots of work companies and organizations collect intel on security threats worldwide. And these are universities, these are, these are think tanks, these are, you can hit this up, companies like IDS and IPS companies, you know, virus, virus companies, virus share, they're all collecting all this information and they share this information with each other, which is a really great thing. That stuff gets funneled into the rule sets of IPS softwares, IDS softwares, but also in the SIEMs. Right? And then in turn, it's taking stuff that you do with your rule sets and, and things that you're doing, your DNS list, other sources, it's putting all these things together and it's determining what you ought to be looking at. Saying, hey, this 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 meets this look this is a threat model we've seen before. You should go look at it. So you're not having to do all this work yourself. It can be daunting to sit there and say, I'm going to put in SIEM and I need to develop all the rules to understand what could be nefarious activity on my network. You don't have to. This stuff will get fed in and it will be fed to you. And I just, I just think it's a huge thing if you ought to be looking into it if you haven't already. Questions before I move on or just let me know, Kara? There aren't any at this time, but thanks. All right, Kara. And next page. A little delay there. Okay. So I don't know if you can see the top. It's looking a little funny on my screen, but that's okay. Threat and intelligence, threat intelligence and layered security. This is just sort of model of what that looks like. Will streamline gives you those actionable that actionable threat intelligence. And again, talking about SIEM collecting the data from multiple services. Um, use for analysis and incidents response. And then active threat intelligence, which thinks domain list, which you get pushed out to secure devices regularly. And again, all of this is done with the collaboration of the InfoSec community. But the key. Have, I'm sorry, Hero, we do have a question. Wouldn't you need a dedicated SOC to do this functionality? That is a great question. Depends on how big you are. Yes. We, my company has an SOC, we outsource our SOC, we do, for that reason. We don't want to hire that many people to look at it. Uh, I do know companies, I've worked for companies that have an internal SOC too. It just depends, just depends, but even, even when it's culled down and it's really only the, the things that matter that come through, you, a lot of stuff coming at you. You need to investigate. That's a and great question. Again, and then once again, if you would explain what an SOC is. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Security Operations Center. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so you have, you have a Network Operations Center and a Security Operations Center, and they can be the same center. Generally, I think they are in businesses, in a lot of businesses. Okay. Great. No further questions at this time. Okay. So, so really the point on this slide is without, without even getting to virus protection yet, right? If you have your next gen firewall, you have an IPS in place, have, or an IDS in place, and they're getting this information from the InfoSec community, and you have layered all the way up to the PC, not including the PC, the industry believes you can stop about 85% of malware coming in before it hits the PC and then hopefully your virus protection tags it from there. I think that's a pretty cool number. That's, that's not depending on your PC to block all the malware. Hence the point of layer protection. Any 
And then I think I'm running a little short on time, so I'm going to buzz through this. Other stuff to consider. Weak passwords. You talk, uh, someone asked a question earlier about what's the number one attack vector, social engineering. Well, it, this too, I mean, this is part of that. Weak passwords are bad. So Verizon did a really neat study on this. And 76% of all attacks on corporate networks were the result of weak passwords. So the number below that, this is a, a pretty interesting stat. If you take a random eight-character password, just random eight-character password, doesn't matter, a single PC, modern PC, you know, multi-core PC, will hack that in brute force within eight to 72 hours. You do a 10-character complex password, 19 to 58 years. I think that's a big deal. So, and, it, and generally speaking, this is the first vector they will try. They're just going to try, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and all those simple passwords, use password as password, things like that. So consider strengthening your password policies at your sites. We talked about social engineering. Again, follow eight, ATE, awareness, training, and education security concepts. One of the great examples I've seen, I've seen a lot, is people calling claiming to be IT techs, right, and asking store folks to do things. Um, even while we've had some great store folks who've managed to block the vast majority of this, using two-factor authentication takes that makes that a non-issue. You have two-factor authentication into your sites. So something to consider to help defeat some of the social engineering out there. And another good point, too. You want to protect your C-levels, that's great. But the admins oftentimes have more on their laptops than they do. Just a few last bits of common sense. And we talked about it a little bit. Don't let one stored network pass traffic to another. It's OK if they're on an MPLS network. I'm just talking about this PC pinging that PC. You never want to allow that if you can avoid it. Do not get behind on patching. And here, here's kind of a strategy for that. They're, they're just, I know we've seen this, especially in server, in server uh, environments. Like, well, these servers are production servers, and we can't take them all down. Develop server groups or patching groups that have, with your business, and have an agreed upon maintenance window. And we're going to do this group with this maintenance window, this group with this maintenance window. So much of it is really just getting with your business partners, getting them to understand the problem, and getting their cooperation buy-in on when you can do this stuff. Third point, this is something I think is pretty cool and I found it very effective. You have screensavers at your stores, right? I mean, make screensavers that just give neat messages that say, you know, they give hints on how to protect the environment. Don't accept calls from, you know, from IT people unless you validate. Uh, just well, awareness stuff that you can put on the screensavers. It works really, really well. And then maybe the thing, I, if I have a soapbox, this is probably it. Look beyond compliance. Passing an audit is simply a point in time. I'm not saying it's a bad point in time, but it's a point in time, right? Security is vigilance and commitment. Because after your audit, someone's going to make a request. Your environment's going to change. You're going to put in a new piece of equipment. Something's going to happen. You may have great change controls in. But something's going to happen. You need to be vigilant at all times and really keep your focus on safety. And let's face it, if you're secure, you're likely compliant. So seek security. And just some sources. I didn't all make this up myself, just so you know. Q&A. Hubert, thank you. That was 
great presentation, and um, you know, it, it's obvious you know your stuff, and um, we really appreciate the fact that you are a not only part of Maverick, but you are also a volunteer for Connexus. So um, we do have a few more questions. Um, first one is, who would you call if you don't have a firewall? Well, okay. If I, who would I call if I don't have a firewall? Yeah. How can you find a firewall? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I can't mention. Um, we 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 have a call that we don't mention companies. Um, but I I, 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 think I think it's what's that, Carl? I was just going to say that you know you could certainly talk to your brand because your brand oftentimes is is um, bringing that sort of security and firewall provider. Um, also, talk to your payment processor. I think that's great. That is really super good advice. Both of those will work really well. Okay. And then, you know, you're, I think it's fine to say, you know, you have some really big name brand providers out there like Cisco, for instance, and, you know, that those guys, um, you know, that's, that's probably where you ought to go. But I like Kara's um, idea very much. If you're a brand, if you're a branded distributor, or brand your company, you might want to call your folks at the brand. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it is helpful if you also use somebody who is well known in the industry. And so, like I said, your payment processor is probably another good resource for that. Clearly. Clearly. Okay. We have a few more questions for you. And uh, should we be doing this ourselves or using a service provider? Great question. The answer is yes to both. It just depends on where you have competency. Okay. Oftentimes, and again, I can, I'll use my company as an example. Uh, we do outsource our SOC because, frankly, we're not qualified to run a SOC internally. We need to go outsource that. Um, we handle our network internally because we are very qualified to handle it internally. Uh, point of sale is a is a collaboration between point of sale uh, resources and internal resources. So there's no one straight up answer for that. I just think where do you have competency, and if you don't, it's probably more expensive to go get the competency than it is to outsource it. When you look at it, that's again one kid's opinion. Sure, you know, and there there may be some other service providers like even your firewall provider could certainly help you start with some of the basics. I think. They're certainly, certainly. They're security experts. And, and also, I would recommend, actually, as a really good start point for security, go to Visa's website and pull down PCI version 3.1. That is not a bad blueprint at all yep. to, to look at and just see what you ought to be doing. Sure. Another question is um, regarding the presentation availability. And the presentation will be available after this webinar concludes. About an hour after this webinar concludes, you'll, be, you'll receive a survey. And it's just a survey of six short questions. And once you complete the survey, then you'll be given the link to where the, you can download the presentation. And then the presentation will be available on the Connexus website for up to two weeks. So, Next question is, with the understanding that some incident, sort of breach or otherwise, will eventually happen, um, can you emphasize the importance of having an incident response plan because after the event is not the time to develop a plan. Well, that is such a great point, and I, I'm, I'm almost feeling bad for not putting a slide in just on that point. Good question. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, you, not only is it important to have an incident response plan, but something we do, and I think uh, you ought to consider it, is we do tabletop exercises where we'll, we'll have someone make up a uh, disaster scenario, for instance, and then we'll go on. You know, we'll, we'll meet in a room and figure out what our plan of action ought to be, and then we'll document that, right, and figure out what we did right, did wrong, and sort of uh, run through the exercise of that disaster. Great point. I can't emphasize that enough because once it happens, you need to act fast. That's huge, and really, training is what's going to get you there. Highly encourage you to do tabletop exercises on that exact point. Great question. Thank you. Great. Another question is, wouldn't managed security services be the ideal way to go rather than doing it yourself? Uh, can be. 
Depends on depends depends. If it, so it may make sense. Yeah, there's no one answer for that one. Uh, if if it makes sense in your model, sure. There's some great providers out there. Yeah. And, and it also goes back to what you said too about the expertise with internally. Sorry, Hubert, but I think you had mentioned that yeah. earlier about your internal expertise. Yeah. What what's your what's your you know your competency level? What's your willingness to commit resources internally to do this? And then when you're looking at outsourcing this kind of stuff, again, we do our security operations center because that makes sense to us. But some of the there's also the maintenance aspect of it. You have in some cases you have people who are also doing your maintenance also taking care of configuration and taking care of the day-to-day -day on security too. So that's just going to be company by company, I think. Great. Thank you. Next question is, Visa has established a new requirement to hire you know, the qualified integrators and resellers, which is that new QIR program that's required to install and maintain um, point of sale systems. And that's specifically, I believe, to level four merchants. And um, all right, that's, that's really where they're hitting it. Um, can you speak to this requirement from a petroleum retailer perspective? Well, uh, we're, I can only tell you we're going to comply. You know, we're, 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 a, we're a level four. And, and that makes total sense. What they're really saying is, we don't want you to go get um, gel blow to go fix your point of sale because you want the people who are certified, who are hopefully vetted and understand the importance of payment card security and have been have been blessed to do so, right? Right. So and, and, it's a license to operate. Correct. But as I recall. Okay. Or, uh, that did not preclude you from using internal resources. Correct, correct. And um, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that you know we're seeing so many IP-based point of sale systems, especially in petroleum. This is kind of a new game for us. I think I think a lot of the other industries have been there for a while, but especially to those of us in petroleum, it's really key because you know we've got these guys out there and you know no disrespect, but I mean, they're point of sale guys. They're certainly not network engineers. And so now they're forced into a new ball game where they're forced to being network engineers in addition to being the POS guys. And so I think that's, that's really kind of where Visa's headed with that. But boy, Carla, that's so true. And oftentimes your POS guy is your pump guy, right? Exactly. And, right. But now even that's changing with EMV and with IP enabled pumps. Now you've got a computer sitting on top of a pump and you've got a network you know, going, you know, it's not, you know, two-wire uh, cereal anymore. Or your dad's two-wire cereal. It might be two-wire two cereal, but it's running IP. And it has gotten much more complicated. And your, you know, your sort of wrench and uh, wrench turning fuel tech, the guy who replaces the sub pumps, might not be the guy qualified to handle the, the crind or the pump head. Agreed. So Agreed. It, it, the two the world's changing very fast on us on this one. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And there's not much time to get everybody ramped up either because in petroleum, you know, you're supposed to use a certified technician by either the point of sale vendor manufacturer or the AFD or automated fuel dispenser manufacturer. So I would imagine that there's going to be some ramping up on their part as well to get those guys in certified through the program. Yeah, I think as much as anything I worry about you know, their capacity to get enough people developed to do this, to handle us, you yeah. know. So. Yes. Um, next question is, have you started to segment corporate network? So your PII data is separate from other data, and PII would be personally identifiable information. So have you started to segment corporate network so your PII data is separated from other data? We certainly have. Yes, we have. And that, you know, that, if I can expand on that a little bit, more and more your software as a service is becoming a piece of that segmentation strategy and something to consider. Uh, many, many of you may be 
uh, outsourcing your payroll and your maybe your HRM. And now you have, if you, and if you're doing that, that's great. You have that system out in the so-called cloud out there. But you're passing data back and forth, and you're doing integrations with other systems, probably to your general ledger, for instance. And you want to make sure that that is a secure, secure transfer of information, for sure. Yeah, there's a lot to that. Uh, SaaS is a completely. We could do a whole webinar just on, on SaaS and what that means to us moving forward. Mm -hmm. But yes, we are segmenting this out more and more. Actually. We're starting to segment even more granularly than that. We're trying. We're starting to segment, for instance, even um, real estate information into its own secure areas, because that's really tempting information for competitors to get. Interesting. And where do you think uh, loyalty? I just read an article not too long ago about the fact that hackers would almost prefer to have the loyalty app than they were the, the credit card data. Yeah, that's interesting because that gives them easier uh, social engineering mm -hmm. information to get the get the loyalty. And uh, yeah, you probably you if you are storing loyalty information on prem, I would highly recommend getting some kind of encryption in front of it. Don't let it sit at rest in the open. That, that, that's, I think that is a prime target. Great. Well, that concludes our questions. And so we wanted to just remind everybody that Connexus is a nonprofit organization. And they are the technology standards arm for the petroleum industry. They are having their annual conference May 1st through 5th in Tucson, Arizona. And it is for members only. But if you're interested in joining Connexus, um, you can go to connexus.org. And like I had mentioned, Connexus is an independent nonprofit member technology organization. They only have three staff people. People, sorry about that. Only three staff uh, people on staff, and it's mostly run by volunteers such as Hubert and myself. And there are several different committees, and um, we set standards for data exchange and security and mobile. And um, you know, from a merchant's perspective, and Hubert, you would probably concur that it's great to have standards out there because that saves all of us a lot of money and a lot of time in the long run, knowing that that everybody's on board. We've got point of sale vendor manufacturers, we've got automated fuel dispenser manufacturers, and everybody's using those same standards. Oh, I concur, Carl. Can can I can I pitch too for a second? Yes, please. Because there there were a lot of questions asked, and they were honestly really wonderful questions. But look. You were someone asked about who do we talk to or where do we go? Mm -hmm. That's an awfully good group to of people to talk to. I'm not saying Connexus, I'm saying but the, the people that are there you're gonna network with are some of the best minds in the in the industry. Not a bad resource for you to get to know some of these folks. You know. Correct. So and again, um, you know, please complete the survey at the end of this uh, upon the conclusion and you will get a copy of the presentation. So thanks everybody. Thank you very much Hubert. We appreciate it. You gave us a lot of great information today. And so everybody have a great day. Thanks Cara. Thank you.